funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And the Ocean Wind Project by Orsted and PSEG, committed to the creation of a new long-term sustainable clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Finozzi. Showdown at the State House. Good evening. I'm Raven Santana in for Brianna Venozzi. Several Assembly Republicans defied a new COVID mandate, refusing to show proof of vaccination or a negative test to state troopers stationed at the door to the Assembly Chamber. This is tyranny, folks. America, see what's happening Look here. Look at our heroes up here. See what's happening, America. They're not letting the minority party vote. But despite their defiance, they were eventually let in, and state troopers did not physically restrain any of the lawmakers as they entered. It's unclear why law enforcement did not block access. A spokesperson for Assembly Speaker Craig Coughlin said legislative leadership anticipated anyone who did not follow protocols could not be permitted in the chamber. Today, the Senate and Assembly held their first voting session since the November election and the first since the new mandate went into effect. But even though dozens of bills were up for a vote, all eyes were on who would be let in to vote on them. Senate and Assembly Republicans filed a lawsuit to block the new COVID restrictions, but a judge didn't issue an injunction by the time the session started. GOP lawmakers say they're not backing down. The Joint Management Commission doesn't have the authority, and that was, that was part of the unconstitutionality. Also, the fact of access for legislators to, you know, to the State House because let's face it, we all represent a significant number of people and they all, can, they all you know, call our offices with their concerns and this is where we get to voice those concerns. Earlier this week, Governor Murphy called those who were planning to defy the mandate completely reckless. Meanwhile, outside the State House, advocates rallied around bills they wanted lawmakers to pass during the lame duck period, which ends on January 11th when the new legislature is sworn in. A group of activists called for a bill that would set up a task force to study reparations and seek to repair the harms of slavery in New Jersey. And following oral arguments at the Supreme Court yesterday in an abortion case that would topple Roe v. Wade, advocates again called on lawmakers to pass a bill that would ensure the right to abortion in state law. A second case of the Omicron variant has been detected in the U.S. A Minnesota resident traveled from New York City for a convention attended by tens of thousands of people. This as a president unveiled a COVID battle plan today to combat a winter surge, looking to unite the nation in a common purpose and stressing getting vaccinated is a patriotic responsibility for all to help fight the COVID fight. Announcing an expansion in booster availability, calling on pharmacies to expand their hours, providing paid time off for employees to get a booster, and creating family COVID clinics across the country, as well as increasing vaccine shipments around the world. As officials here in New Jersey report a significant rise in positive COVID cases, just over 3,500 and just over 6.2 million fully vaccinated. So what does this all mean? We turn to our resident Montclair State University epidemiologist, Dr. Stephanie Silvera. Dr. Silvera, thank you for joining us. So tell us, do we know yet how severe the illness from this variant is and what are we seeing in other countries where it's more prevalent? So what we're seeing right now is that there seems to be an increased rate of transmission, but not necessarily more severe illness. Now, even if the vir this variant itself isn't more severe, more people sick, sick means more people will end up in the hospital just because as case numbers go up, hospitalizations are potentially going to go up as well. And are travel restrictions doing anything? Un unfortunately, probably not. By the time we've identified these variants, we know that they've already spread. Um, so, for example, it was first identified in South Africa. There's now data showing that it had already been in the Netherlands prior to being identified. And given that people are traveling more and more again, and that we do have a lot of global travel, by the time we identify the variants, they're likely spread globally already. 
Another big question I'm always getting is the efficacy of vaccines and boosters against the variant. Well, what do we know? So we're still learning about that. There was some early data, very preliminary out of Jerusalem um, in Israel saying that Pfizer, for example, seemed to be holding up fairly well. The good news is having any level of immunity, um, having antibodies helps to protect you against more severe illness, even if it's a variant, because we're not starting from scratch, right? We're not a blank slate anymore. Our body does have some recognition of some of the proteins um, on those spikes. So being vaccinated is better than being unvaccinated at this point. And even for those breakthrough cases, people who are vaccinated are more likely to have milder symptoms than people who are unvaccinated. And is another lockdown inevitable? I hope it isn't. I think that we have enough tools in our toolbox now to try to avoid that. So if individuals who haven't been vaccinated um, should go ahead and get their first dose. Anybody who's over 18 and it's been more than six months should certainly go get a booster. But in the meantime, we know the things that work regardless of the variant. So wearing a mask, not gathering in crowded indoor spaces, keeping those windows open as much as possible for good ventilation and proper hand washing can really reduce the transmission of this and any other variant that may come along. Dr. Silvara, the holidays are right around the corner. If you are fully vaccinated, is it safe to attend indoor holiday parties while unmasked? I would recommend um, really knowing who you're going to be gathering with. Is everybody there fully vaccinated? And in this case, I would say fully vaccinated means fully vaccinated and boosted. Um, looking also at how many people are you talking about and what does the space look like? Are you able to create some physical distance? Is there good ventilation? I think gathering in large crowded indoor spaces with the windows closed um, is really a recipe for disaster. All right, a lot of great questions answered, but still so many more that we want to know. Dr. Silvera, thank you so much for joining us. Gun safety is expected to dominate the final weeks of work for state lawmakers as they return to Trenton. Governor Murphy was joined by legislative leaders in Metuchen today as he outlined his priorities for new gun regulations in the Garden State. Murphy's eight-point wish list included a ban on the sale of 50 caliber weapons, a new requirement that all guns be kept locked up when not in use, and a new law that Murphy says would allow the state to hold gun makers responsible for the damage caused by gun violence. Murphy's announcement comes just days after a school shooter in Oxford, Michigan, killed four students and almost two years since a shootout at a Jersey City kosher grocery left four people dead. Since April 15th, Murphy said 180 people have been killed in the state and another 824 injured in 782 shootings. We have to act and we have to act now. We must make enacting the next wave of common sense gun safety laws one of our top priorities in the remaining days of the current legislative session. This session expires at noon on January 11th. Today is December 2nd. We have 40 days with which to work and in which to act. For the sake of our communities and our people, I know there's nothing that we cannot do. 911 is often the first number people call who are experiencing a mental health crisis. But when police officers answer that call, the situation can escalate, sometimes leading to police violence or even use of deadly force. Across New Jersey, two out of every three uses of force by law enforcement involve a civilian identified as either suffering from mental illness or who is under the influence. A new law enforcement pilot program seeks to reverse that trend by pairing mental health professionals with state troopers to respond to 911 calls for behavioral health crises. The pilot called Arrive Together is launching today in Cumberland County in partnership with the state police and the Office of the Attorney General, and it could become a statewide model if it's successful. Cumberland County Prosecutor Jennifer Webb McCray joins me now to explain how it'll work. Jennifer, thank you for joining us. What is this pilot program designed to do? Well, we're really excited about the pilot program and thankful to the Attorney General Brooke, as well as um, Colonel Callahan for choosing Cumberland County for the pilot program. The program is designed under uh, considering the co-responder model. So they are going to pair a crisis worker, someone trained, to address crisis with a trooper um, during 
uh, times that we have seen high levels of falls to respond to um, events that actually may be crisis events. And how did this co-response model come about? Is it based on models that are used elsewhere? Well, I know that there are several models, um, you know, that have shown promise throughout the country. I think what's good about this model is that um, you're going to pair the crisis worker with the um, plain closed trooper, and the trooper also will have some training, um, but the trooper will also be there to make sure that the, the situation is not dangerous, which gives a level of comfort to the crisis worker. Um, and in addition to that, I understand that uh, in times where, you know, basically we do intelligence led policing at this point. So they're able to tell when are the, the, the times where the most calls come in, right? But even in down times, I know that there's a plan to, you know, touch base and go back and speak with people just to shepherd them to getting the help that they need. And it's interesting, Jennifer, because you touched on this. The pilot program also calls for troopers to respond to the scene in plain clothes. Why is that? Well, you know, for far too long, many of uh, situations that we know are actually medical situations, a person in mental health crisis, we know that mental health is an actual medical, um, you know, situation, as well as people who are dealing with substance abuse. Um, it, that's a that's a medical um, diagnosis, right? But oftentimes society pushes those issues to law enforcement solutions, which sometimes are not always appropriate. It is absolutely necessary when a situation is dangerous, it's necessary and appropriate to have a law enforcement officer there. However, um, if we can start addressing these issues as medical issues, we have better outcomes. And a plainclothes officer um, will just, I would presume, make a person feel more comfortable rather than having them feel like their medical situation is being addressed with a law enforcement solution. Hoping we'll see some important change out of this pilot program. Jennifer, thank you once again for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Widespread disruptions in the global economy are being felt here in Jersey, so much that Senator Bob Menendez proposed a bill to address the supply chain problems caused by the pandemic. The bill would establish a national database of manufacturers to let local companies know who makes what product and hopefully avoid future bottlenecking. Senior political correspondent David Cruz spoke with industry experts and lawmakers at a symposium held here in New Jersey, searching for answers to help identify the root of the problem. They needed a part from China that was on back order for six months and they couldn't fix it. And by the way, that part jumped up in price to like $20,000. Welcome to today's supply chain, that Rube Goldberg-like system of ships and ports and trucks and warehouses that get the stuff you just ordered online delivered to your doorstep. Under the best of circumstances, it's a miracle that it works at all. And you'd be tempted to blame COVID for the clogged arteries, but it's not that simple, said speakers at this symposium presented by the Commerce and Industry Association of New Jersey. COVID did not create supply chain problems, but it kind of um, brought up the weak link, the weak link in the supply chain to be more visible. COVID was the match that, lit, that uh, lit the dynamite. It could have been any number of things. It could have been continued trade war. It could have been issues between China and India. It could have been domestic manufacturing problems. The truth is we've been getting more and more of our stuff from further and further away for some time now. The first Cyber Monday took place over 15 years ago. So the pipeline has been pumping. And yeah, add in a global pandemic, that locks consumers in their homes, and suddenly the seams are stretched. I like to describe this as a series of pipes. The ships could be a 12-inch pipeline. The port and terminal capacity could be a 10-inch pipeline. The trucks could be an 8-inch pipeline. The warehouses could be a 6- or 4-inch pipeline. So the capacity of the overall network goes to the smallest common denominator.
And that's how things get backed up all the way to the port terminals where, in California, container ships like these are lined up out at sea by the dozens, sometimes for weeks. That's where that air fryer you ordered is probably sitting right now. Our problems that we're having in all the ports really stem from the inland distribution network not being able to keep up with the flow of goods into the country. There's not enough truck drivers. There's not enough chassis, which are the means of conveyance that you put the containers on. Uh, and because of it, because there's such a backlog, there's a shortage of containers. For state elected officials, admittedly here on a fact-finding mission, there's little that they can do or say about expediting the movement of a container that's been sitting on a dock for two weeks. An expanding warehouse capacity, which almost everybody here says is at the root of the problem, is a tricky issue in New Jersey, with some municipalities calling for an end to what they're calling warehouse sprawl. That is an issue that we really have to get a handle on <clears throat> because municipalities are obviously need to have their interests protected, but on the other hand, we also have to deal with the warehouse need. But th that, is, that is a complicated issue that needs input. Between COVID and, and the uh, infrastructure and uh, lack of supplies and the, uh, and the conflict we have with China, our manu uh, our, so one of the suppliers there, we just need to uh, have, look at these things separately and, 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 uh, and try to resolve them. I think the answer for now is, you know, uh, dig your heels in, where where there's no end in sight uh, right now to the this high volume of cargo that we're handling, um, and I believe that's due in nature to the fact that the virus is still not contained around the world, and when the virus is more under control, um, I believe that the supply chain will begin to normalize again, and then it will go back into um, you know, manageable levels. But that could take years, and whenever it does happen, every link in the supply chain is going to have to be reinforced, from equipment to personnel to warehouse space, because this COVID jolt to the system will not be the last. I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. Are tourists flocking to the Garden State or is the ongoing pandemic keeping them at bay? Rhonda Schaffler has the latest details in all the day's top business headlines. Rhonda? Raven, what's ahead for New Jersey's tourism industry is the topic of discussion at an annual conference underway in Atlantic City. Despite a new COVID-19 variant emerging in the U.S., one expert believes visitors will still drive to New Jersey, knowing that the tourism industry has put safeguards in place. Adam Pearl is the board president of the New Jersey Tourism Industry Association. I do believe that folks are ready, eager, and willing to travel, and we are ready and willing and eager to accept them safely and to do the things that it, visitors expect, whether that be cleaning, whether that's masking, social distancing, online ordering, you know, mobile ordering when you're at attractions, all of that, are those are the innovations that have been implemented. Citing the latest COVID variant, President Biden is asking businesses to voluntarily move forward with COVID-19 vaccine and testing requirements, even though the administration's rules are facing a legal challenge. The administration had ordered businesses with 100 or more employees to ensure that their workers are vaccinated against COVID by January 4th or require that they submit a weekly test. But that was put on hold after lawsuits were filed. Meantime, the administration's separate vaccine mandate for healthcare workers has also been blocked due to a legal challenge. Congressional leaders reached an agreement earlier today on a new stopgap spending bill that will keep the federal government operating through mid-February there's a midnight Friday deadline to get the bill passed. While Senate leaders are on board, some rank and file members said they are not. Toys R Us is opening a flagship store in the American Dream Mall this month. Toys R Us is trying once again to make a comeback after its bankruptcy filing a few years back. It opened two stores in the US back in 2019, but closed them due to COVID. It's also now selling toys in Macy's. More big moves on Wall Street today. Here's a look at how the stock market ended up. I'm Rhonda Schaffler, and those are your top business stories. 
Support for the Business Report provided by Fuel Merchants Association of New Jersey and Smart Heat NJ, and by Junior Achievement of New Jersey's Business Hall of Fame, a virtual event on December 9th at 6 p.m. More information online at janj.org. And make sure you tune into NJ Business Beat with Rhonda Schaffler. This weekend, she puts retail in focus as we enter the holiday shopping season. Rhonda explores the growing supply chain and staffing challenges and takes a look at how changing shopper habits is impacting how stores operate. Check it out on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel, Saturdays at 10 a.m. Joint Base McGuire Dix Lakehurst has been home to roughly 11,000 Afghans since they fled their homeland in early September. Liberty Village at the base has served as one of eight so-called safe havens for these evacuees, a temporary stop as they await permanent resettlement here in the United States. Today, senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan got our first look inside their home away from home. Brenda? Raven, we're here at Joint Base McGuire Dix Lakehurst. We spent the whole day, got a tour of Liberty Village. It's where 11,000 Afghan evacuees are living, and they're very grateful for the safety and for the security. But while they're looking forward to new lives and resettlement, many of them are also looking backwards. Do you feel safe? Yeah, I'm safe, but I don't feel good because I survived myself on that day, which I left Kabul, but rest of my family is there. And physically I'm here, but my thoughts are there with my family, with my friends. It's crowded here. Um, yeah, there are many people and we have to, we have to, mm, we have to get into lines for everything. But it's still, because we're safe, uh, it's fine. Liberty Village is actually three separate camps, each one with its own military mayor who holds a town hall meeting once a week. The logistics of housing, feeding, clothing, and caring for all these people, 40% of them are kids, is utterly intense. As with any community, there are occasional disputes among our Afghan guests. However, our experience has been that, that is the exception and not the rule. Liberty Village has become more than a temporary stop on our guests' way to, on their settlement journey. It is a place where they live. Our unwavering goal has been to make their life in this temporary location better every day. Villages one and two offer housing in old red brick barracks. Village three features family apartments and pods, enormous tents that can hold more than 500 people. Folks can play soccer outside or learn conversational English in class or watch Bollywood movies. Three cafeterias serve hot halal meals 24 seven. Medical tents seat three to 400 patients every day. Everyone's been vaccinated against COVID here and about 100 babies have been born all at nearby by hospitals, of course, since Liberty Village opened. Counselors stand by to help. Some are originally from Afghanistan. They understand the culture shock many evacuees are feeling. I was standing in their shoes seven years ago. I was a refugee from Afghanistan that came here and now I'm in the Air Force and seeking American dream. So you say, look at what I've been able to do? Yeah because there's no language barrier. We are committed to ensuring the success of all our guests as they adjust to their new lives and prepare to be resettled. Do you know where you might be resettled? Have you? Yes, I'm gonna going to be in Ohio. Ohio. In Ohio? Yeah. Do you know anything about Ohio? Uh, yes, uh, I've watched many uh, videos about it and uh, yeah, it's good. <laughs> so far, 3,500 evacuees have been resettled from Liberty Village, and they can end up anywhere in the U.S., even Ohio. Planes are still arriving. The next one is due on Sunday, and this mission is expected to continue through at least February or until everyone finds a home. I'm Brenda Flanagan reporting from Joint Base McGuire Dix Lakehurst for NJ Spotlight News. Raven, back to you. Thanks, Brenda. Before we leave you tonight, a Christmas tree controversy that is creating some buzz. Officials in charge of the Asbury Park Boardwalk decided this year to change things up by ditching a real pine tree in favor of a cardboard holiday tree that stands about 17 feet high. 
The reviews have been mixed, with some people calling it beautiful, awesome, and brilliant. Others, however, aren't so nice, calling it ridiculous and hideous. Comparing it to a pile of Amazon shipping boxes and a giant cat scratching post. Wow. A reminder that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That does it for us tonight, but if you missed any of the political headlines this week, tune in to Reporters Roundtable, where senior political correspondent David Cruz talks with Senate Minority Leader designee Senator Stephen Orho about the vaccine requirement at the State House dividing lawmakers and the upcoming legislative session. That's tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel. I'm Raven Santana. Thank you for watching and have a wonderful night, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association, the PSEG Foundation, and by the Fuel Merchants Association of New Jersey and Smart Heat NJ. The Ocean Wind Project by Orsted and PSEG will provide renewable offshore wind energy, jobs, educational, supply chain, and economic opportunities for the Garden State. Ocean Wind, committed to the creation of a new, long-term, sustainable clean energy future for New Jersey.